Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Confidence Mpofu Kambu. I'm a case nurse manager at Family Health International. Today, I shall be taking you through risk communication in health emergencies in response to COVID-19. So our learning objectives uh, is just to equip us or to remind us of the relevant knowledge and skills in effective risk communication and as well as we are going to be engaging the communities at all levels, including the communities that are at risk, we should be able to provide regular uh, feedbacks using appropriate communication channels that have been built and are in place for us to use. So at the end of this module, I want us to be able to understand the core principles of risk communication and its application to COVID-19 outbreak or actually to its application to disease outbreaks in health emergencies. So how are we going to do this? We will do this through first maybe defining risk communication, what it is, and also identifying its, fo its foundational building blocks, which are very uh, core and which are very vital in leading us to be able to put it to its best practice. So what is risk communication? A risk communication refers to the real-time exchange of information, advices and opinions between experts or officials and people who face a threat or a hazard to their survival at any given point in time. So what does it mean refers to real-time exchange? It means this is the now exchange of information between these two people, two kinds of people, the experts and the people that are in the community, right? So what is the ultimate purpose of this risk communication as well? So its ultimate purpose is that everyone who is faced or who is facing this hazard or threat is able to make informed decisions to be able to mitigate or to navigate their way out of this situation as they are facing a, a, a pandemic or as they are facing a disease outbreak and be able to make a preventive action or actually or even take protective action uh, against this um, hazard. So during risk communication, there are some uh, very vital uh, uh, things that, that happen or uh, some steps that are very important that need to occur. For example, there is information sharing and there is uh, engagement that happens. So people sit down together, they share information, they update each other on what is happening, what has happened, what is to, what is to happen next. And then there are decisions that are made. And then of course, at the end of it all, there is ultimately action that needs to happen. And this action, its, its, its ultimate goal is to re reduce reduction or to reduce risk uh, reduction, which is actually what we are all looking up to. All right. So as we are doing this um, risk communication, we use uh, a mixture of strategies and tactics. We use public communication uh, using the medias that are put in place. We use uh, media communication. We are seeing so much of this media communication with regard to COVID-19. We also use social social media communication, we use our community engagement as well. We even use stakeholder involvement. Uh, we also maybe use political communication. I'm just picking a few uh, for the sake of time. And then um, all these communication strategies are important for us to put into use during this risk uh, of COVID-19. So COVID-19, as we all know, is not a uh, the first epidemic perhaps that the world is encountering. We will recall that we have had the SARS of 2003, the pen flu of 2009, uh, the mers cov of 2012, the Ebola of 2014, even the Zika syndrome, if some of us still remember it, uh, the Zika syndrome of 2015. So COVID-19 is part and parcel of the 21st century epidemics, and we are not afraid that it is here. Just like any other epidemics, we are going to communicate on how to actually uh, uh, prevent it, protect against it, and at the end of the day, 
be dry and file over it. So there are characteristics of information that need to be shared during a risk uh, emergency such as this one. We may all be well cognizant of the fact that when there is a, a risk that is posed or a health risk that is posed, there is so much of uh, misinformation that is circulating in the atmosphere. There is also so much of uh, resistance perhaps that we get even as the health fraternity or the health people that we get just from the community around or from lay cadres around us. Even so much of political influences and rumors that um, you know, surround this COVID-19 that need us to dispel and need us to actually come out and correct them effectively. So as we are going to be communicating on COVID-19 and all that it entails, we will use preferred channels of key audiences. We will also use existing information sharing networks effectively. We will also adapt to cultural educational aspects that have been put in place for us in the community and be able to reach out using this risk communication strategy. We are also cognizant of the fact that yes, during this uh, era, there is high demand for information. People want to know everything there is to know about COVID-19. People also want to, you know, to be on their toes. They want to, to know as they were sleeping yesterday, this is what they knew about COVID-19, but tomorrow it's a new day. They need more information. They need to know how to protect themselves. They now understand that the, the condition can mutate. So they need to understand what is it that we should do to protect ourselves. And of course, we are cognizant of the fact that there is urgent time frame that our different stakeholders are running after or racing after. The laboratory is racing against time. Uh, the nurses are also racing against time. Yeah, the, you know, the rapid response people are racing against time as they are conducting conduct of positive cases and so forth. So in delivering communication with regard to each and uh, every arising situation, we need to be effective and we need to be prompt and we need to be consistent. And also there is a, a rapid and effective dissemination of information that needs to happen even at community level. As soon as you hear something that has to do with COVID-19 that is authentic, that is being actually owned by, you know, respective health organizations like WHO, you disseminate it outside to the community so that it helps uh, the community and everybody. So this is all that uh, characterizes information. Information needs to be well handled during this period. It is uh, very, very vital, but it needs to be well handled. So there are some building blocks uh, in risk communication. Uh, there is technical information that is uh, important that we need to armor ourselves with. We need to have technical information, all the technical information there is to know about COVID-19. We need to armor ourselves with technical information. We need to stay at the top of the game. We need to know what is happening, what are the studies saying, what is it that we need to do, how do we break the chain of infection. Now we are aware that even asymptomatic cases can actually spread the virus. We need to know how that happens as health practitioners and be able to explain it to the community at large in the levels of understanding that they are. We need to also respect the, the community's values. We need to build trust as we are communicating about this high uh, risk or this hazard or this threat of COVID-19. So trust is the most important. We need to be cognizant of it and we need to establish it and actually to keep the trust doors open so that every other information that we come to build on you know, gets to be well received. We need to ensure that all the information that we are sharing is credible. We need to ensure that we actually source this information from reliable bodies. And as we are communicating anything concerning COVID-19, we need to show some expression of caring. We need to show some TLC. People need to understand that as much as this uh, 
threat or pandemic has caused so much havoc, has caused so much problems, has caused so much worry. Uh, we still, as the health fraternity, we care for them and we empathize with them and we sympathize with them and we want them to understand that this too shall pass, okay? So trust is very important. Uh, as we're communicating to individuals and organizations, it gets to be the greatest factor that uh, establishes, you know, uh, reliability and also unity. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit more deeper into trust because as we're communicating with the public, the public is going to perceive us uh, with the information that we are sharing. Okay. So like I said, we need to be experts in our field. We need to know what we're talking about. We need to know how to fix people's problems. We need to agree with other non-health bodies uh, in each and every information that we are sharing. That will show that we have good expertise. So we are experts in our field. Not only that, uh, people will judge us of good character, they will judge us if we are telling them the truth with regard to COVID-19. They will also be able to tell if in whatever we're telling them, we're not omitting any information. They will also be able to tell if we are reliable sources of information. So I urge you ladies and gentlemen that whatever you are communicating with regard to COVID-19, ensure that you are a reliable source of information. Also, as you are communicating whatever, risk information, you need to identify yourself with the people that you are addressing. There is need for you to show that you share the same values, you also share the same experience as well as the same fate with them. You are not at a higher ground somewhere, you are down here on earth with them, what they go through, you also go through. So there is need to identify with them, as well uh, as uh, showing some sense of goodwill that is very paramount. People need to know that we care about them. We care for them. As much as COVID-19 is um, a disease that we are still trying to learn to live with, we're still trying to adapt to it being here, but people uh, are still loved, we, we care about them. We know and we want to know more of their concerns not only do we want to know more of their concerns, but also we want to address their concerns. If it means involving other stakeholders or involving other groups, that is what we will do because it shows that we are with the people. Then as we are communicating risk, it is important to be cognizant or to actually remember not to over reassure people it is also very important as well to talk about the event itself, the COVID-19 event itself, how it started, how, where we are as the kingdom, uh, the risks that are involved, what has been done so far to reduce the risks and the interventions that we did and those that we are doing and those that we are actually intending to do because as we go progress with the condition, new things come into place, new things come into play, new strategies arise. So there's need for us to address them head on with regard to the given situation in any given scenario, okay? So it is not wrong to actually acknowledge uncertainty uh, uh, and sometimes even fear but it is, of course, important to reassure uh, after it all to say, yes, the situation is like this. COVID-19 is a condition that is, is, you know, it's a gray condition, but with what has been pre presented so far, we are able to manage it up to this point. And actually, the studies are showing that uh, most of the cases, the majority of the cases are presenting in this way, and this is what is being done. Fatalities are there, but they are not as much, and et cetera, et cetera. By saying such things, the people are actually reassured, and they are also, you know, they gain confidence, and they see that there is a hope for tomorrow. So we also need to express in our communicating that a process is in place for almost everything that has to do with COVID-19, whether it is, um, 
you know, uh, laboratory collection of specimens, whether it is managing a client, whether it is responding to a positive case, the a process is in place and there is a channel that is being followed, structures have been put in place and all is going so well so far. And then as we're also involving the community, we need to be cognizant and respect that the people will always be there to support us, the people at community level. So we need to give them things to do. Uh, at any given point in time when there's an emergency, we know that human beings have uh, this hormone, this interesting hormone called adrenaline, which we call the F hormone. So when there is a, a, a danger that has been posed, the F hormone, uh, which is the adrenaline, makes you to either be ready to fight or to, fl to flee. So in this case, we want to encourage everybody. We know that COVID-19 is a condition that most of us are fleeing from, but people want to know what they should do actually to reduce you know, the cases or to reduce the incidences of them passing the virus from one person to the other. So we need to be able to give people things to do as trainers in the facilities. We need to be able to allocate and delegate people to do stuff that will actually assist to reduce the risk of uh, getting the virus. So why do we engage communities? We do engage communities because in the communities, that's where we find the cases, yeah? By cases, I mean that is where we find infected people. This is where also we find exposed or vulnerable people. So there's every reason to involve the community. So, and also the other reason why we involve the community is because we are seeking to see behavior change with regard to reducing risk of transmission of COVID-19. And so we know that once we involve the communities, we disseminate the right information on how risk reduction can be done. The people are going to cooperate with us and we'll see drastic change, thereby reducing cases of COVID-19 that are positive. We also are seeking collaboration for response interventions. This is not an easy exercise. It's a taxing exercise with regard to finances and everything, even into the kingdom or into the ministry as well. So we're seeking collaboration for response interventions from every other stakeholder outside there who is willing to join hands with us in this common fight of COVID-19. So, in community engagement, ladies and gentlemen, they are guiding principles. So it is very, very important or very vital to actually be cognizant of them and to follow them uh, in this order. You need to clarify your purpose. You need to be clear about the purpose or your goals of engaging the community. And then also you need to be knowledgeable of the structures that are in the community so that you follow the channels correctly and respectfully. We know that the community is made up of traditional leaders uh, of the land. It is also made up of religious leaders. It is made up of different stakeholders. It is also made up of community members. So there is need to be cognizant of all these structures and follow them uh, effectively and correctly so that we gain maximum cooperation from every individual. We need to partner with the community to create this change that we so much desire to improve the health of every individual. Every member in the community needs to feel safe. Every member in the community needs to feel loved. Every member in the community needs to feel empowered to fight this COVID-19. There is also a need for us to establish relationships and build trust as we work in the community. How do we do that? We create formal and informal relationships in the community as trainers or as healthcare workers. So there is need for us to establish relationships uh, thereby facilitating a win or triumph over COVID-19. So the public always perceives risk differently. Uh, you will be aware that, uh, or already you are aware that as individuals, we are less concerned about health risks that are voluntary those that we go out and seek on our own, we are less concerned about them because if you want to avoid them, then you will not go out seeking. And we are also less concerned about those that we're familiar with, you know, 
uh, somebody can say, I've always had this ulcer disease since I was young, so I'm familiar with it and I know how to actually control it or to avoid it, so I'm not worried at all. And, and somebody will also say, ah, I'm able to actually control this condition. I've had it since I was a baby or since I was a teenager, so I'm able to control it. Uh, for example, somebody might be having asthma and they know that they can control the asthma attacks by using a spray inhaler and it's working for them. That is good. And the other good thing about, you know, concerns that are, that are always perceived to be less risky are those that are not fatal. Somebody cannot die probably out of those conditions. So somebody will say, I'm not concerned about this. I can manage it. It will not make me die. So I'll be there even tomorrow. So what the heck, I'm not concerned about it. But then, ladies and gentlemen, it becomes more of a concern now when the health risk is involuntary. Is COVID-19 voluntary? It is certainly not voluntary. It can be gotten by anybody at any time. Are we familiar with it? We are not familiar with it. It is a new epidemic. It's a new pandemic, and we're still trying to navigate our way through in getting to understand what it is and how it can be you know, you know, protected against or how the chain of transmission can be broken and also how it can be managed in terms of medicinally. And is it, can it be controlled? It cannot be controlled because you think you're controlling it by all these other measures, but it can actually, you know, find its way in and you do some tests and you discover you have COVID-19. So it really, it's so difficult to control it, but what we can do is to try our level best to actually be able to control it. Is it fatal? Yes, it is fatal. Uh, it is, we do have some, you know, fatality rates and they are increasing here in the kingdom of uh, Eswatini. So there's need for us to actually, you know, be more concerned about this because it is claiming lives. Is it focused in time and space? No, not at all. It's not focused in time and space. It is actually moving, yes. So it can't be controlled. So there is need for us to protect ourselves and our families and even the communities at large against COVID-19. So as health practitioners, or as trainers or as people that are well informed about COVID-19 out there in the community, there is need for us to gauge a risk or to have what we say is risk perception. For experts like me and you, a risk is always high when there are high levels of morbidity or mortality. COVID-19 has high levels of morbidity and mortality. They are always, uh, it's always a high risk when there are high levels of disability. So I'm not talking about physical disability where somebody can be, perhaps maybe let's say you're involved in an accident and you get to lose a limb or something. I'm talking about, you know, disability like restraining, restrictions. COVID-19 is making us to have so many restrictions. There are many things that we cannot do now due to COVID-19. We cannot go out, we cannot have these social gatherings. We cannot, some of us, uh, you know, have been retrenched at work, hence, there is so much disability that has come with COVID-19. Therefore, it is a high risk. There are also high levels of property loss. People have lost property with regard to, you know, to COVID-19 and its effects. People have also lost fin finances, too much financial loss that has come with uh, COVID-19. So it is a cause of concern. It is regarded as a high risk. There is so much political impact that we are seeing in our media every day, so much political impact that we are seeing on the ground in the country, in country, even at global level, even at uh, continental level. Yes, it has come with COVID-19. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I believe you'll agree with me to say COVID-19 is indeed a high-risk pandemic. They are are steps to effective risk communication that we also need to bear in mind before we close. We need to know when to communicate risk. Risk cannot be communicated at any given point in time or just randomly or abruptly. You just need to know when to communicate risk. So we do have this normal uh, COVID-19 virus. We need to know when to communicate the risk that is posed by COVID-19. This means we need to prepare our ground effectively so that the seed of communication that we plant gets to grow.
We need to know whom to alert or who to tell or inform who should know about COVID-19. It's not everybody that we can tell at one go using the same language, using the same speech. It's different. It comes in packages. The community is made up of different people, like I said. So we need to unpack all the information and see who we are addressing at any given point in time, unpack our message and bring it down to their levels of understanding, whether it's our different uh, stakeholders in the community, whether it's lay people, whether it's our colleagues, or whether it's other you know, religious leaders or traditional leaders, we need to know how we communicate anything that has got to do with COVID-19. You also need to get training to communicate risk effectively and with empathy. So as we're all here today, we're being trained, we're being empowered, we're being armored to get more information on COVID-19 so that as we go out, we're able to disseminate the right uh, information and the proper information with all that COVID-19 entails us to. Things to know, communities are always involved. Why? Because communities always experience most intensively any emergency at any given point in time. They are the first and final responders of any pandemic. They live with the consequences of death, disease, disability, suffering, and any societal or economic loss that comes with any threat or hazard. So they are the biggest group. They have the biggest stake, you know, that they, have the, they face the biggest a uh, uh, threat or the face the biggest uh, what they are the biggest receptors of any pandemic at any given point in time so we need to deal with them with tlc tender love and care we need to nurse them and we need to psychologically address their issues when they come to us in the health facilities or wherever we are when they stop the cars as you are moving they are seeing the minister of health cars and they stop you to tell you we are experiencing this challenge give them an ear listen to them and reassure them because they need your help they need you to move along with them they need you to address their issues they see you wearing a nurse's uniform and they stop you by the road and they ask you i have a case i have uh, somebody who is like this in my house and they are showing signs and symptoms of this how do i deal with it take your time assist that individual because they are communicating something with you so you need to communicate your knowledge back to them and assist them and let them understand that they can conquer COVID-19 I tell you together we can do it communities will not automatically trust strange people that come to actually give them information or they don't need strange response teams so we need to work with the local created uh, response teams and they need to trust that we always do the best for them and um, we don't always need to be telling them what they should do but like i said we need to get this feedback mechanism. We need to also hear their side of the story. We need to understand what they are going through. We need to hear their concerns. We need to hear what they need us to do or how we can help them. Then that positions us to actually get to win over uh, this COVID-19. Co community engagement as well offers methodologies for response teams and communities to work together to stop an outbreak at any given point in time, ladies and gentlemen. So in all that we do, in all our communication, let us be first communicators, let us be the fastest communicators, and let us be the most frequenters of communicators with the communities that we are involved with or with the communities that we engage with on a day to day basis. We say what we know, what we do not know. We also say it because this is not a cast and, you know, they say it's a cast and stone case. It's not. So we're still finding our way through this COVID 19. We're navigating our way. You tell them what you are doing, you know, as the Minister of Health, and then you show some transparency in your saying, and you build trust. People will learn to trust and ride on your shoulders, and together you will make a formidable team. People always want facts. Give them the facts that they need. Always show them that 
there is life tomorrow. COVID-19 has not come to kill us, but it has come to strengthen us. So I believe together we can do it. Thank you very much.